Okay. You, you, were, you were educated overseas. Um, what, what sort of brought you back to Singapore in the first place to start at McKinsey? Um, oh, um, well, I mean, I guess I was abroad for three years, but you know, most of my family and friends were here. And at the time, I mean, there was a pretty good job offer in Singapore, so I came back, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, there was a, a Street Times interview that was done with you when you were 17, and you'd won a, a, you know, a debating competition. And wow. there, was a line, there was a line that, that said you wanted to be a lawyer like your father when you grew up, and that you'd want to be a member of parliament. Really? Yes. Yeah, so, so how early, you know, uh, what, what sort of uh, made you want to get into politics at such an early age already to get you thinking about it? No, I mean, I was involved in debating. That was probably from a, was it after a debating competition? Yes, it was a, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so that was my first experience of debating. I thought all politicians did was debate. Obviously, when you're 17, you don't know the full works. Mm -hmm. um, then I was in university. I did more debating. That that was also policy debating. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I mean, once you start work, you just have no time. So, you know, I just focused on work for a long time. And then when I had a bit more time, I came back into the party because of my interest in policy. Mm -hmm. But I think it was really the grassroots stuff that made the big difference for me, especially the MPS sessions and so on, because then, you know, I guess that's where the rubber hits the road. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about, you know, sitting in debating chambers and discussing policy. It's a lot more about actually meeting people, understanding the issues, mm -hmm. and solving it on your own in the first instance, um, you know, before you think about policy issues. Mm -hmm. So um, if you were to become elected, to get elected and a member of parliament, are you therefore, you know, achieving this, this dream of yours when, that you had? It's a dream, I probably, yeah. I guess when you're 17, your views are very rose-tinted. Um, mm -hmm. Now I think, I, you know, I guess with every passing day, you sort of feel the big weight of responsibility on you. It's a little bit scary at times, but mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I see it as a lot of hard work now mm -hmm. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a dream, I don't know. It's, um, I guess when it becomes reality, you suddenly realize that there's a lot to do. Mm -hmm. uh, as an elite, how do you think you can reach out to the masses? Whoa, I'm an elite? <laughs> First time I'm hearing that. <laughs> And especially to the lower-income uh, lower group, how are you going to reach out to them? I mean, to be honest, um, one of the places I helped with, Chongpang, I think uh, the demographic there, you see a lot of two-room, three-room flats. We meet a lot of poorer people. And I think at MPS, most of the people you meet are actually you know, the people who are struggling with the most basic issues. And I've never had an issue, you know, I think, understanding them and trying to help them as well. Um, I mean, even when I was helping at Admiralty, I think that's a slightly better off ward because, you know, a lot of four-room flats and above. But there are two rental blocks that have opened there. So you see a lot of, yeah, issues, you know, people with, like, young people with four or five children, no jobs, can't make ends meet. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's, they have problems. And, you know, if you apply your mind to it, you can help them with it. And when you do, I think, you know, they appreciate it. But there are some older generation, they will think that um, you're really up there. You don't really understand my problems. So how are you going to reach out to them? I've really? met a lot of older people, actually, uh, at MPS sessions and so on. And sometimes it's a bit difficult because, you know, I don't speak Malay, I don't speak Chinese. But the other grassroots volunteers around, they help translate. And I... I've actually not had very much, you know, I think difficulty connecting with them, understanding the issues. Because even my own family, I think, you know, like my grandparents, my grandmothers didn't have a lot of education. So, you know, all of them, they spoke Malayalam at home. My parents were better educated, so, you know, I could speak English at home with them. Um, so I guess in that sense, I'm, you know, almost comfortable being uncomfortable in that way. You know, you may not speak the exact same language, but you can still connect. I mean, as long as there are other people there who can help you. What is your greatest regret in life? Um... To be honest, I mean, as a general rule, I don't dwell on regrets. I mean, you know, um, I mean, you know, I think you make mistakes, you have your ups and downs. But I think the important thing for me is I've learned from every one of them. So if you ask me for what I regret, very little, actually. Have you ever encountered any setbacks in your life? Yeah, I mean, so some very early on. I think when I was in secondary two, that's when, you know, we first got a computer at home. And before then, I used to cruise through school. I didn't work very hard, but you know, still got by okay. But then I got addicted to computer games, and I think I finished close to the bottom of my class in sec two, was pushed to the bottom class. I was like, oh, my goodness, you know, whole life is gone. That's the end of my future. But then, then you realize, you know, like, you know, I just gave up computer games after that and then focused on my work, and you know, things turned around. Um, and, you know, every now and then, yeah, I guess, you know, you take a few knocks, but, you know, you pick yourself up again. Vikram, you're, you're an you know, uh, up-and-coming lawyer in a big international firm. Why, why go into politics now? Why not focus on your career first and then join politics later? Yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, um, I started helping out at the grassroots level, not with any expectation that you know, I would wind up here. And um, you, know, you, sort of, you go for a few tea sessions and all that, but you know, even then it never actually, it never sort of hit my mind that this was actually going to happen. Um, so... 
I would say, you know, eventually when the question was asked, it was, it was not an easy decision for me uh, because, you know, I mean, it's not just your own life, but also, you know, you don't know whether you can live the rest of your life normally. Um, you know, I mean, you don't want your friends to get dragged into it, your family and so on. So it wasn't an easy decision. Um, and I'm still going into it with, you know, a little bit of nervousness. Um, but, you know, we'll see how it goes, I guess. Um, your, your fellow candidate, Ms. Tien, she, I mean, she, on, online and on some circles, she's being criticized for, not, for lacking political maturity. And you're not exactly as young as, as her. <laughs> how, I mean, how do you address these issues um, in terms of your age and experience? Well, I mean, um, I, th I think, you know, you can never have too much experience. I would you know, be much happier if I had 10 years, 20 years of experience, but I guess we all have to start somewhere, and I'm going to give it the best bash I have. Um, How do you feel about some of the, the remarks that have been made about um, well, I've actually, I've known Paling reasonably well, and, you know, I've worked with her on a couple of things, including wifey me. I think she's actually quite mature for her age. I mean, I'm not sure what the full extent of attacks are, but I've heard some of it has been, you know, fairly crass, and, you know, pretty much dug up personal information, chucked it out, put whatever spit on it. But, I mean, knowing her personally, I think she should be able to carry on the job. I mean, she's worked extremely hard, she's very organized, she gets people together, she gets things done. So, yeah, I've got no issues with that. So uh, what do you think your strengths and weaknesses are? And if you are elected, what's the first thing that you want to do for the residents? I think for me, the first thing I will do is try to understand the residents wherever I'm deployed. And that's one of the things I've learned from both the MPs I've worked with. Because I think every ward is different. Within each ward, every neighborhood is different. Every block has its own issues. So I think really understanding the ground, the nuts and bolts, is one of the first things you do. And you know, there's no easy way to do that. You've got to walk the blocks. You've got to meet the residents, understand the issues. Then you've got to mobilize the right people to deal with it. So I think the first few years will be a lot of very hard work. And that's part of the reason, I guess, for the nervousness. Um, it's because you know, there's really no shortcut. And, and then there are a lot of, you know, you've got to work with the grassroots leaders, you've got to, you know, work with the other community leaders, if there are any religious organizations, you've got to work with them too. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nuts and bolts to get sorted, I guess. So what are your strengths and weaknesses that you think? Um, that's a tough question. I think, um, I think my strengths are that I'm quite, you know, I mean, if I have a job to do, I will do my best to get it done. Um, I think I'm okay at working with people and getting people together to do things. Um, I think my biggest weakness would probably be, you know, I wish I could speak a lot more languages, you know, particularly I wish I could speak Chinese, dialect, Malay, because, you know, I realize there are a lot of residents who speak different languages. Um, I mean, I'll try to overcome that by, you know, hopefully having the right supporters with me and, you know, the right uh, friends. Um, who do you admire most out of the foreign politicians that you know? Oh, foreign politicians. That's a tough one. Um, I think I was growing up in the 80s, so probably the politician with the biggest impact to me was probably Ronald Reagan. And that's even now, you know, when I look back and, you know, look back at a lot of his speeches and so on. Because a lot of the things he did, I think, in the U.S. were actually quite remarkable for the time. Um, Care to, like, oh, okay. Well, I mean... One of the things he did, I guess before he came into office, the U.S. was going through, I think, a period of high unemployment and high inflation. Um, I think one of the first things he did was, you know, turn the economy around. Um, and then the second thing he did was, I think, you know, quite remarkable. I mean, in foreign policy, I think, you know, he basically stood firm, stood by his principles, um, you know, basically stared the Soviet Union down and eventually reached out his hand, um, you know, when a friendly person appeared on the other side. I think, um, you know, I mean, I credit him with, you know, a lot of the work that went towards the end of the Cold War um, and foreign policy. On the domestic front, I think he, you know, he laid the foundations for a lot of America's, um, you know, spectacular growth beyond that. But at the same time, I mean, he was also a person who was very much grounded in the day-to-day -day concerns. I mean, you know, a lot of people say that he's the man who broke the unions, but he actually started out in the union. He was in the Screen Actors Union. So in that sense, he also, I think, understood the needs of workers. Um, I think one of the biggest things he did was, you know, he cut back a lot of the bureaucracy, a lot of the unnecessary inefficiency, red tape and so on, reduced taxes substantially so people had the opportunities to, you know, work and keep their income. So, yeah, I mean, foreign politicians, I think he's one of those I put high up there. Yeah. You like to debate, and uh, have you ever debated any of the Singapore policies with your friends? All the time. Uh, the For the policies? past three years, yes. <laughs> so Sorry? Um, well, okay, 
I think there are many kinds of debaters. There's some debaters who you know, believe strongly in issues, go out there, beat the table, and argue for it. I think as a debater, and this is why I think I, I, just, I related all the skepticism, I'm one of those who actually... I, I think when I became a debater, a lot of my views actually became a lot less strong because, you know, as a debater, you don't know which side you're going to argue. You have to be ready to argue both sides. So in that sense, I think I became a lot more balanced in my debating. And, in, you know, the extreme passion was probably tapered down a lot because, you know, you realize there's always another side to the question. Um, so, you know, and that's why I guess although a lot of my views are, you know, probably in line with PAP, I also understand where a lot of people on the other side are coming from. And a lot of people who, you know, I mean, are pretty good friends of mine who disagree with a lot of the policies of PAP, and, you know, they challenge me on it. But because, I guess, I think their heart is in the right place, you know, I don't hold it against them personally, and, you know, I just explain, you know, where I disagree with them. What do you make of the quality of debate in Parliament? Um, actually, I think a lot of good questions are asked, and, you know, I think... I mean, the trouble is, I think not a lot of publicity is given to it because, you know, you don't get a lot of the aggression and soap opera and all that you may get in some other places um, because, you know, I think people are actually asking questions on the specific policies. But I think if you pay attention to the arguments, there are actually a lot of very good questions asked on policies. And I think the reason for that is because, you know, if you actually work with the MPs on the ground, I mean, one of the things people say about Singapore is there's no separation of powers, but I think when you work with the MPs, you actually see the separation very clearly. I mean, you know, the MP is like an advocate for the residents. You understand the case. And quite often, the people that you're making the case out to are, you know, different government agencies and so on. So I think a lot of the MPs are forced to become very sensitive to the issues people have with policies, and that's what they raise in Parliament. So, you know, it may not be as sensational as, you know, discrediting, you know, the ministers and calling their names and so on, but I think they do raise all the ground issues quite directly. Thank you.